Um, all right, so we're going to present. Um, oh, that's not the first slide. We're going to present some new results on uh, geographic adjustments to our historical estimates of an SPM-like poverty measure in the CPS. Um, Laura and I are part of a larger group at Columbia University who has tried to take the uh, methods of the SPM and with as much fidelity as we think we can, um, track that back in time, which turns out to be back to 1967, in order to sort of reanalyze trends in poverty, I should say. Um, this project's been funded with uh, generous support from Annie Casey and also the JPB Foundation. Um, and Trudy sort of set us up nicely by saying the one thing that we haven't been able to do um, to date is implement the geographic adjustments to the poverty thresholds, and that's not actually true anymore. So, because um, that's what we're going to—that's what we've done, and that's what we're going to show you today. Um, so, I'm just going to talk about some of the big picture really quick, and then turn it over to Laura, who's going to take most of the presentation and focus on the actual meat of what we did, um, and then show hopefully brief, briefly some of the, the key results. Um, but the, one of the limitations of the SPM, right, is that it's only been available since 2009 um, with all the questions that you need to compute it in the CPS. And when you start going before 2009, you start to lose uh, elements of the SPM that you would need to calculate the full measure. Um, the first one you lose is in 2008 would be that, that move, the child care expenses, et cetera. Um, so we thought um, that uh, an improved measure of poverty would be helpful to analyze long-term trends, especially trends in anti-poverty policy since the war on poverty, since every year you get a version of, of this quote that we fought a war on poverty and poverty won. So that's why we wanted to take it back to the 1960s. Um, so this is work with Jane Waldfogel, Irv Garfinkel, um, Liana Fox, Neeraj Kaushal, a uh, sort of cast of characters. And Laura's our newest cast member. Um, so just to do the, the, the broad brush of what we do, um, we use historical consumer expenditure survey data to get the poverty thresholds to the best of our ability. So you have um, five years of, these th uh, of CEX data um, for most years back to 1980. Um, and then there's one, uh, one CEX in 1972-73 and one in 1960-61. So we developed thresholds for those years uh, to the best of our ability. Um, and in the resources side, like I said, things keep falling off the CPS the further back you go in time. So that's the move in 2008. <coughs> You lose food stamps, for example, prior to 1980, housing subsidies prior to 76 or 75, um, and then there are no tax estimates on the files prior to, um, to 1980. So we try to do the best of our ability to uh, do various imputations uh, to the resources side to add uh, missing data uh, back to the files. Um, we do our tax calculators for years prior to 1980. Um, and are able, therefore, to create what we, we call a historical SPM, or a historical uh, version of the SPM. In some work that we do, we also use um, what we call an anchored supplemental poverty measure. Um, and that's where we don't allow the poverty thresholds to vary um, in a quasi-relative fashion over time. So what we do there is we take uh, the most recent five years at the time was 2007 to 2012. And we treated that as our uh, 2012 poverty threshold that we then anchored back in time using just changes in inflation. And that's where we use the CPI URS, since that's the inflation measure that um, is used in, in a lot of the earnings statistics. Um, so this is sort of the, the key finding um, that Michael Arce was talking about in the beginning that shows, in contrast to the long-term the long-term story using official poverty rates, when when you use this improved anchor, what we call what we think is an improved um, anchored version of the SPM, you see the poverty is actually fallen by about 40%. But again, these numbers were always not adjusted for uh, geographic differences in the cost of living. And then the neat part about the anchored SPM is you can use it to um, separate out the role that the that resources coming from policies and programs are playing versus other, um, other sources of resources. So you can see the growing impact of taxes and transfers over time when you back those out of the measure of poverty. But um, I guess the big picture and why we're so excited that we've been able to, to um, do the geographic adjustment to the poverty thresholds is not because we love geographic adjustment for its own sake, um, but more because this will allow us to get um, poverty rates for key subgroups that we think are important, as well as uh, state level rates. And so there's a big hunger, I think, for people to know how much government policies and programs are reducing poverty in their state and how that's changed over time. So this is really a tool to get us from point A to point B. So that turn over to you. Thanks, Chris. Right. Um, so I'm basically going to spend some time talking about how we do the geographical adjustment, and then oh, you're leaving. Um, 
time talking about how the geographical adjustment actually gets done um, and kind of the nitty gritty of it. I'm not going to go into too many specifics um, because of time reasons, but I really do want to show some pretty interesting results kind of to give you a sense of where the geographical adjustment really matters and for which subgroups it really matters and it really changes the poverty rate and where it really doesn't sort of matter at all. And these are sort of preliminary findings and so um, I'm really looking forward to a discussion um, afterwards. Um, and so to sort of get into how we actually do the adjustment, um, so we follow, and I followed as closely as possible, basically all the working papers that, has come out, that have come out of the census. So that's Kathy Short's work, um, Trudy Renwick's work. Um, and so we're basically trying to, as faithfully as possible, kind of stick to that methodology from those sort of 2011, 2012 working papers. And so what we're using, um, just like they use, is the gross median rent for a decent two-bedroom unit. Um, and so decent is a unit that has um, both a kitchen and a bathroom. Um, we use a, just like they do, a relative geographic Geographical adjustment, um, which is computed basically by taking the gross median rent of whatever metropolitan statistical area or geographical unit you're looking at um, and putting the sort of the national average on the bottom. Um, and so any kind of multiplier or geographical adjustment that is over one would be for an area that is relatively expensive as compared to the US population, um, and under one would be relatively inexpensive. And I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir here because the real experts on this um, are actually in the audience. So if I say anything terribly wrong, please correct me. <laughs> Um, and so the data sources um, that we decided to use for this adjustment, remember we have to go all the way back to 1967. So basically the decision that we made was to use the sort of the best data that we have in each year. And so the best data that we have in this sort of most recent years are basically from the um, SPM research file. And so we're using the geographical adjustments that the census put together. But of course starting in 2008, we don't have those anymore. Um, and so we start using the Department of Housing and Urban Development's fair market rents. And we are very sensitive to the sort of footnote on the litany of limitations um, to the FMRs. Um, I think that's Kathy Short's work. Um, and so we really are using that because we have that information in every year. Um, and that's kind of what the FMRs have going for them, I think. Um, but you know, this is something that we've talked a lot about. Um, and so it'll be interesting to have a discussion about that too. Um, and then starting in 1984, when we no longer have the FMRs, we're using the decennial census. And so we have the 1970 and 1980 decennial census, and we're kind of you know, linear, linearly imputing um, between the two of those. So that's sort of not ideal either. Um, and so again, sort of using the best data that we have um, when we have it. And so what does the adjustment look like? Um, it basically looks kind of exactly like you'll see it in the Census Bureau uh, working papers because we're really trying to replicate their methodology. Um, so on, in the numerator of the adjustment, you have the, um, the gross median rent for that two bedroom up in the numerator of the numerator. And then you have the sort of national average of that in the denominator of the numerator. And then you have the, the normalization factor um, in the denominator, which basically means that the geographical adjustment at the national level sort of is a wash. And what we do is we apply that geographical adjustment um, as a multiplier to um, the shelter and utilities portion of the threshold. Um, and so that's slightly different for the three different types of kind of owner occupancy. Um, and then what we do is we compare that kind of geographically adjusted threshold to the actual resources, and that's how we get the geographically adjusted anchored supplemental poverty measure. Um, and so now I'm going to show a large list of graphs. Um, and in all of these graphs, um, the regular line is going to be the geographically adjusted anchored poverty rate, and the dotted line is going to be the unadjusted rate. So all of these graphs are basically going to show you for different subgroups in different regions of America, they're going to compare the geographically adjusted poverty rate to the unadjusted poverty rate to give you a sense of kind of the impact of the adjustment. Um, and so you can see here, so this is for non-metro areas, um, you can see that geographically adjusting the supplemental poverty rate actually results in a decrease in poverty in non-metro areas. And that sort of makes sense because non-metro areas are relatively less expensive than other places in the country. And so we kind of adjust the threshold down until we get kind of a lower poverty rate there. For metro areas, um, the sort of the inverse is true to a slightly lesser extent. And so metro areas are usually relatively more expensive um, on average, although there's more of them, and so that sort of increase in poverty is, is a little bit smaller than for non-metro areas. And so moving on to kind of other demographic groups that we think are pretty important and interesting to think about. Um, this dovetails really nicely with Sarah's um, presentation just now. Um, you know, uh, we can see for, for Latinos here, for example, um, geographically adjusting the supplemental poverty measure, we actually see an increase in poverty um, among Latinos, and that's 
because Latinos tend to live in sort of relatively expensive states uh, like California. Turns out California is pretty expensive. Surprise, surprise to some of you in the audience. Um, the geographical adjustment doesn't really matter for some of the other um, uh, demographic groups, um, partly because I think they're sort of more randomly distributed around the country and are sort of exposed to uh, a larger variety of different types of you know, housing costs. And so for whites, we don't really see a huge difference, although um, poverty does sort of you know, go down a little bit when we geographically adjust. Um, and for African Americans, it um, goes down a little bit as well. Um, and so sort of just kind of by construct, sort of mechanically, if we look at different regions of America, um, we can see that um, geographically adjusting does kind of impact the poverty rate that we see. So the West is relatively more expensive than sort of the average of America, and we can see that uh, reflected here in the adjustments. And so adjusting for these geographical um, kind of differences in expenses, um, we can see the poverty rate goes up um, sort of in the region of the West. Um, and the, the, the inverse is, you know, not surprisingly for the South, we see sort of the poverty rates go down. Um, interestingly, I think the Northeast has become sort of more expensive, relatively expensive over time. We can see the adjusted and the unadjusted rates kind of diverging um, starting in the 1990s. Um, and in the Midwest, it's sort of a similar, kind of a similar story and maybe um, less important. And so there's a variety of kind of demographic and regional subgroups um, for which the adjustment really doesn't matter at all. Um, and one of those is for kind of family structure. And so you can see that the adjusted and the unadjusted lines are basically on top of each other, so geographical adjustment doesn't really do much for them. Same with cohabiting families um, and married families. Um, for children, if we're looking at different age groups, um, again, you know, people are sort of randomly distributed across America, more or less, and so the geographical adjustment doesn't really matter for children, for working age adults, um, for the elderly, really. Um, and of course, um, again, the experts in the audience really understand kind of the hoops that we had to jump through to do this all the way back to 1967. Um, and so there's, there's quite a number of you know, interesting things to talk about and limitations to the work that we've done. Um, so for example, you know, one of the issues is that um, we're using metropolitan statistical areas um, for our sort of our geographical adjustment when we have them. Um, we don't have those when we're using the census, for example. So we're using a metro and a non-metro and a non-identified. Um, thank you. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are certainly some limitations um, both to the CPS, of course, as has been talked about plenty uh, today, um, as well as the geographical adjustment um, in particular. And so happy to talk about that in the question and answer session because I think it's, it's really important to discuss. Um, and then maybe I'll bring Chris back over here for some of the conclusions if that's okay. <laughs> Come on down. Thanks. Um, yeah, so... So this doesn't fundamentally change, I don't think, some of the key results that, we, that we've had for a couple of years now. But um, I think our next step is really to take this down to the state level and really try to, now that we have um, a fully geographic adjusted measure for each state and each year, let's try to understand the efficacy of different policies and reducing poverty rates across high cost areas, low cost areas, places with you know, state earned, fact, earned, earned income tax credits, um, you know, more liberal SNAP eligibility rules, things like that and see whether those things matter um, for, uh, for increased poverty reduction. Um, and then the other thing that we, that I'm not sticking to this slide, <laughs> um, the other thing that we want to do is um, for each state, we're going to do a fact sheet that'll be hopefully like a simple two-page um, fact sheet that will just sort of show, you know, here's the child poverty level in Wisconsin, how's that changed over time, um, what are the impacts of the total government policies and programs on poverty rates in Wisconsin? How has that changed over time? How has that changed for children? How has that changed for the elderly, et cetera? Um, so we think it's going to be a really cool tool um, and then uh, should, should really help us get a better understanding on historical changes in, um, in the effects of, of government policies. So thank you. Thanks.